want to read uh, two scripture passages for you. They're both from the New Testament, one from Matthew, one from Luke, and both of them would be Jesus speaking on the subject of forgiveness. So I'm going to start in uh, chapter 18, um, reading the parable of the unforgiving slave. Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, how many times could my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, I tell you, not as many as seven, seventy times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who wanted to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began to settle accounts, one who owed 10,000 talents was brought before him. Since he had no way to pay it back, his master commanded that he, his wife, his children, and everything he had be sold to pay the debt. At this, the slave fell face down before him and said, be patient with me, I will pay you everything. And the master of that slave had compassion, released him, forgave him the loan. But that slave then went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him, started choking him, and said, pay what you owe. At this, the fellow slave fell down and began begging him, saying, be patient with me, I'll pay you back. But he wasn't willing. On the contrary, he went and had that man thrown into prison until he could pay what was owed. When the other slaves saw what had taken place, they were deeply distressed, and they went and reported to their master everything that had happened. Then, after the master had summoned him, he said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you also have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And his master got angry and handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay everything that was owed. So my heavenly Father will also do to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from his heart. And then over in Luke's gospel, just a couple verses in chapter 17, again, Jesus said this. He says, be on your guard, in verse 3. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in a day, And comes back to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. May God add a blessing of understanding to that reading. Let's bow our heads and pray. Gracious God, forgiveness is something we all want. And yet it's something that we're not always willing to give. And your word ties the two together, Lord. You tell us very clearly that if we want to be forgiven, we must be willing to forgive. So, Lord, I pray that you would teach us that principle this morning and realize that in forgiving others, we truly are set free. I pray that the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. You know, I preached a sermon a couple weeks ago on gossip, and I cannot believe how many people were talking about that sermon. (laughs) They weren't gossiping about the sermon, don't get me wrong, but I did. I had a lot of people come up to me and say, thank you for that sermon. We needed to hear that, and it's something that I I just don't preach on a lot. What's interesting is forgiveness is kind of like that, too. I would stand to reason that almost in every sermon, I probably touch on forgiveness because you can't talk about God, you can't talk about Christ's death without bringing in the subject of forgiveness. But what I don't preach on a lot is our role in it, our necessity to forgive. I want you all to think of somebody right now that you need to forgive. Or somebody that you need to ask forgiveness from. I'm not going to ask you to name them in church. You're not going to raise your hands, nothing like that. I just want them in your mind so that you know this sermon applies to you, not to the person sitting next to you. Have you ever noticed that? A lot of times you think the sermon's better for the person next to you than it is for you. It doesn't work that way, by the way. It's for you. It's for you. So, forgiveness. And if you're thinking about that person, then God can can teach you through this how to how to come to forgive and I will practice what I preach I wanted to share with you one of the hardest people I've ever had to forgive in my entire life and some of you know this story a little bit but um, it's my dad Uh, my my dad 
cheated on my mom with her best friend when I was like three or four years old, and he left our family, married my mom's best friend, and left my mom to raise my sister and I. And um, growing up without a dad was really hard. I, I had red hair back then, had, I have, but I got teased a lot as a kid, and this was back in the 70s, and to be divorced was a rare thing back then. I'd be a totally normal kid now, you know? But in the 70s, I wasn't. I was just one of the few that came from a divorced family, didn't have a dad at home. And I had a love-hate relationship with him growing up because I never got to see much of him. He, from the time I was five to the time I was probably 15, maybe once a year I'd see him. Every now and then we'd spend a little time with him, but nothing you know, to develop a relationship of any sort. And at the same time, I was watching my mom struggle to kind of make ends meet, and it, it just built this resentment towards my father. And yet I also still knew he was my dad, and I'd hear he was in town, I'd get all excited, and, and yet there was never that relationship. Well, when I got into high school, I, I was a pretty good athlete, and I went to high school in Baker, and Baker has this radio station, KFLN. And it hits all of eastern Montana. And so they carry a lot of the Spartan games. And um, I was playing fullback and linebacker, so my name was on the radio a lot. And my dad started going up on the hill by the family farm and listening to my games. Now, I didn't know this at the time, but we were in a playoff game up by Sydney one time. And after the game, we had won. We are sitting in there. All the guys were around a table. I was with a bunch of my friends. And in walks my dad. He comes and sits down between me and my friend John Newman and acts like we've been father, son the whole life. It was one of the most awkward things I've ever gone through. Because all my buddies are looking at me like, who's this? And I'm like, I don't even really know him myself. But I introduced him around and he got up and left. Well, what was interesting is he wrote me a letter after that wanting to try to rebuild our, our relationship. And it was great. And so this would have been like in October well, that March, he got killed. He was hauling uh, scorio to oil well sites up by Bainville, Montana. This was back in the 80s. And he was coming across one of those old country railroad crossings that just has the sign and no siren or anything. And a train was coming through, and he was killed instantly. And what was interesting about that is I went from not even hardly knowing my dad and that incident actually made national news. He was on CNN. He got his 15 minutes of fame there. But what was interesting is how much that made me hate him even more. Think about that. I was resentful and angry, and now we're trying to get back together, and all of a sudden, he's gone again. And it did. It created this, this anger and this resentment in me. So from the time I was 16 to the time I was 20, I was turning out just like him. The Bible teaches that the sins of the parents will be visited upon the children. And what that means, it doesn't mean God's going to punish your kids for what you did. It means your kids might turn out just like you without God in their lives, right? And that's what I started to do. I started to drink and I started to act just like my dad because I was so angry at him. Well, when I was 20, I became a believer, um, accepted Christ into my life. I'd like to say I forgave my dad that day. I did not. I carried that with me for several more years. And it was actually after I became a pastor, I realized I can't do this. I can't be hating my father. I'm breaking one of the Ten Commandments and then standing up on Sunday telling everybody else that they have to forgive. And so I started this process of trying to forgive my dad. That is really hard when the person's not alive. How do you have that conversation with them? How do you get into that? Well, um, I used some different tools of writing him a letter. I actually went to the cemetery where he's buried and had a little conversation with him and God. And, you know, through that, it was a process. But I came to a point where I was able to release all that bitterness and resentment and realize, you know, that... My dad made mistakes, and yet I wouldn't be alive if he hadn't played a role in that. And I also think that's why the Bible teaches us we have to honor our mother and our father no matter what. Because without them, you wouldn't be here to dishonor them. Do you get that? I mean, so you got to be that way. You always have to see them in that light. Well, I think one of the things that helped me the most is when I became a father of my own. 
I think one of the things that helped me the most is when I looked at my own decision-making process and realized it wasn't so good and healthy either. And I started to realize I wasn't so much different than my dad. That's where God wants us. You know, a lot of times we look at people that have hurt us and we're like, they shouldn't have done that. They're such a bad person. What God always wants us to see is that we have that same tendency in our own heart. Whatever has been done to us, we have that ability to do that to other people. And we get all self-righteous and sanctimonious about it, like, well, they did that, and they shouldn't, and they're a Christian. And the truth is, anytime you point the finger at somebody, the old thumb is sticking right back at you, isn't it? That's what God wants us to see. That's what this parable teaches. Imagine this. Imagine that you owed millions of dollars to Joni Carlton at the State Bank of Townsend. I just saw her, and Joni, I'm going to pick on you, right? Millions and millions of dollars. That's what 10,000 talents is, by the way. A talent was a weight of gold, and it's an amount of money that nobody could come up with. you got to go down to State Bank and reconcile with them, and you're in trouble because now, in this day and age, you can be thrown into what's called debtor's prison. Think about that. You owe somebody money, so they put you in jail till you can pay them. Is it ever going to happen? No. You spend the rest of your life because of that debt, unless you have a redeemer. This is really good. <laughs> Somebody that comes along and redeems you from that. I'll get to that in a moment. Otherwise, you're going to go to jail. You're going to be in that debtor's prison. So here I am in front of Joni, owe State Bank millions and millions of dollars, and I just fall on my face. I'm like, Joni, I can't, I can't pay this. And Joni says, well, we're going to come up with a payment plan. You're going to pay me a dollar a day for the rest of your life. I'm going to cut your debt in half. You're going to have to pay the second half of it. Or I can't let you off the hook. I'm bound by federal regulations. You're just going to have to go to jail. That's what we would get in a human. Joni would do something nicer than that, mind you. But that's what we would get, wouldn't it? There would be no out. Except in this case, the king is in charge. He doesn't just run the bank, he runs the whole show. This guy's on his face in front of him, and the king just takes compassion. Did you hear what he said? He forgave the debt. He didn't say, all right, I'm going to let you off the hook, you get another week to pay. Or No, he forgave it. Millions of dollars wiped off the books. Now that sounds really good, doesn't it? Except this bozo goes out and finds David, who owes him a thousand bucks, and starts choking him to death. Give me my money! Isn't that just crazy? Well, he's broke, because he, he couldn't pay that, so he had no money. So now he's thinking, well, I'm broke, at least I'm even. What about all these people that owe me? Well, David couldn't pay it, so the guy was so ornery, he had David thrown into jail, and the next thing you know, it gets back to the king. Which, by the way, if you don't remember anything from this sermon, remember this. It always gets back to the king. All right? No matter what we do, it gets back to the king. And when the king finds out, he is livid. Why? Because of the hypocrisy. Because of this man who has been set free, but is unwilling to forgive. Now, you hear the story, and you're like, okay, I get that. Well, the story's about you and me, all right? The king is God, and what has he forgiven us of? (sighs) Something we could never repay. There's no way we could ever repay for all that we've done wrong. And yet he forgives us. He makes it right through our Redeemer, through Christ paying our price. We're set free. What right do we have to carry a grudge against someone else? That's the message. What right do you have to not forgive somebody else? And the answer is you don't. You don't have any right at all. Because of the great forgiveness God has given us, we have to release those who've harmed us. And it's hard. Especially if somebody's hurt you and you didn't do anything wrong. It was an innocent thing. And yet they're just belligerent about it and off. And Lord... Well, the Bible says vengeance is his. We've got to trust God with that, and we need to forgive. Why? Because when you forgive somebody else, 
you're not letting them off the hook. You're letting yourself off the hook. If somebody hurts you, they're still going to have to answer to God for that. They're going to still have to answer to their conscience. They're still going to have to maybe answer to the world system or whatever it is. God will take care of that. What he wants us to do is trust him with it. As soon as we can let it go, we're freed. You know, when I was able to forgive my dad and really honestly feel good about that, the Holy Spirit filled that void in my life where all that resentment and anger was building up in my heart. I'm doing this just to give you a visual image. But as soon as that was gone, that void was replaced with God's grace and his forgiveness and his love. And it's helped me to learn to forgive other people too along the lines. One of the things that helps me is as soon as I start thinking about somebody else and what they did, now the Holy Spirit almost convicts me instantly. You know, well, Wilma, she did this. And then I'll be like, oh, yeah, I did that too. That's how it works. You know, if you're sitting there and you think this sermon is for somebody else, you better listen really carefully right now because it's for you. We have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every single one of us, you're like, well, I don't know. I'm a pretty good guy. All right, well, let's just run through the Ten Commandments real quick. You put God first in your life and everything. Because I'm a pastor and sometimes I don't do that. I get selfish and self-centered and start thinking about my own life instead of my call. So that's an easy one to get out of whack. And by the way, if you get that one out of the whack, the other nine come tumbling down too, if you notice that. How about idols? You got any idols in your life? A television set, money, a hobby. There's all kinds of them that come along. You ever use the Lord's name in vain? You ever use it as a cuss word? I'm not asking you to confess it to me this morning, but get on your knees and tell him. You remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy? You did today. Good job. <laughs> but you got the whole day to do it, right? And do you do it each week? Do you take time each week to really focus on God and your relationship with him? Do you honor your mother and your father? Do you honor your parents? A lot of times we don't think about them. We get so busy in our life that we're just kind of forgetting about theirs, right? Have you murdered anybody this week? Some of you are like, you finally got to one I haven't done. <laughs> Except by Jesus' standard, he says if you're even that angry at somebody else, you're murdering them in your heart. Did you commit adultery? Again, by Jesus' standard, if you even look at somebody with lust in your eyes, You've committed adultery with them in your heart. Have you stole? Maybe you didn't rob State Bank, but have you been honest in your dealings with other people? Have you bore false witness? Have you lied? You know, a lot of times we lie and we don't even realize we're lying. We say that, we're like, well, you know, that wasn't really the truth. And it's so hard to admit that we didn't say something true. And yet, I bet we stumble over that one a lot. And then what about the last one? Covet. You know, our whole culture is geared towards coveting. Every commercial and advertisement is teaching you to sin. Did you realize that? It's teaching coveting, all right? That's just the Ten Commandments. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm trying to do two things. One, make you realize your need for forgiveness, which thank God we have a Savior in Christ. But also... If you're capable of those types of things, what right do you have to point your finger at somebody else? What right do we have to carry those grudges? We have to forgive so that we can be forgiven. Jesus tied the two together in the Sermon on the Mount. He said this, if you don't forgive, God's not going to listen to your prayers. That sounds like something I just made up, doesn't it? It's right in Scripture paraphrase slightly but he teaches that if we're not willing to forgive God's not even going to listen to us when we're praying that'd be a pretty important reason for a pastor to make sure you had a clear heart right if I'm going to pray for the church and I want God to hear my prayers I better be willing to forgive John for being so ornery sometimes right we have to be willing to have those clean hearts because if we don't forgive we won't be forgiven Think of Jesus hanging on the cross, some of his last words. He's looking at the people that put him there, and what did he say? God, get them. Get them. God, forgive them, for they know not what they do. 
Do you realize that prayer was for God, not for the people? Did you hear it? He was, he was talking to God. I think Jesus knew, hanging on the cross, that the Father's wrath was about ready to explode, and he was going to destroy everybody. And Jesus comes with, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The whole Old Testament is built on forgiveness. That's what sacrificial system's all about. You commit a sin, you need to be made right. So there was a sacrifice made on your behalf. Jump to the New Testament, who's the sacrifice? Jesus himself. The perfect, unblemished Lamb of God died for our sins. Think about that. Paul gets it best. He says, God did that for us while we were enemies. What would he do for his friends? Well, I'll tell you what. When you become a friend of God, the first thing that will happen is you will forgive other people. Because it's part of his character. If the Holy Spirit's in your life, he's going to start moving your heart towards forgiveness. You've got to forgive. Every time that word is used in the Bible, you know what it means? It means to release a debt. Remember in the the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses, we say, but in a lot of translations, it's forgive us our debt as we forgive those who owe us debt. In the Old Testament, it was always a release of this debt, this owing that we had. Well, it's God. We owe him so much for what he's done for us. The only proper response is to try to model that as we go. I don't like preaching these sermons because you know what's going to happen to me this week? Somebody's going to hurt my feelings. Somebody's going to be mean to me. Somebody's going to say something about one of my kids and I'm going to want to punch him in the nose. And instead, because I'm a believer, i got to get on my knees and pray for them. And it's not, Lord, drop an anvil on that person's head. Get them, Lord. No. When we pray for those that have heard us, we pray that they will come to know the love of God. That they would be blessed just like we want to be blessed. When Jesus said praying for those who persecute us, that's what he's talking about. Is we pray, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. And there's something beautiful that happens when we release that forgiveness. It's what I was talking about earlier. The Holy Spirit fills the void. You'll be filled with this peace that surpasses understanding. You know, if there's somebody in your life right now that's still living, and you feel like you can have a conversation with them, do it. Try to come to a place of forgiveness with them. If they're a long ways away or that doesn't make it possible or whatever, you can write letters. Sometimes that's even better because it gives us a chance to put something down on paper. But the most important thing is just do it. That's what Jesus said. He didn't say write a letter, give him a call, and sit down, get a counselor, and work it all out. Peter said, how many times, Lord? Seven? Seven was the number of completeness in the Bible, so it was Peter's way of saying, you know, am I getting this done? If I forgive him seven times, it's completely. And the translations are all different. Sometimes it says 77 times, Jesus said. A lot of translations, it says 7 times 70. That's 490 times you need to forgive somebody. Start checking them off. No, it's not that. It means completely. He wants us forgiving people completely. Someday you're going to stand in front of God. And I bet if you're holding grudges and resentment and unforgiveness towards other people, he's going to bring that out. He's not going to just slide it away. He's not going to just let it go. Because his kingdom needs people with pure hearts. Sin can't exist in there. And unforgiveness, friends, might be the worst sin of all. It's one we don't think much about. But it's a horrible sin because it destroys us instead of the other person. It's an old phrase. But resentment and bitterness are drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. Doesn't make any sense, does it? That I would drink some poison and wait for Willie to die. Oh, he's going to get his now. Oh, I'm not feeling so well. Doesn't work that way. All right? Well, we want Willie to go. I don't want you to go. We want Willie to go, but the resentment's killing us. That's all we can think about. That's all that it's doing. You know, a lot of people that are dealing with depression, anxiety, stress, those kind of things, it's rooted in unforgiveness in their lives. There's somebody that they're still just, not willing to forgive. As believers, we don't have a choice. 
It's not like we can pick and choose what we get to do and what we don't get to do. And this is commanded to us by our Lord that we must forgive if we want to be forgiven. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, teach us to forgive because we're selfish, proud, self-centered people. At least I am. And we want it our way. And yet, Lord, it's your way. And sometimes, even the hurts and the pains that others have caused us, Lord, you work them together for good. You teach us through it. You make us stronger. You teach us to be more loving and kind. And Lord, I know for some, this is a tough sermon. Because there's somebody that's hurt them greatly. And yet, Lord, you know. You know each and every one of us and what we're going through. You know what we need to do. And so I just pray that you would show us, Lord, And it's not just so we can be believers. It's so that we can experience the power of your spirit. That, Lord, when we get rid of that bitterness and that resentment, that's when your spirit flows. Because your spirit is a spirit of love. And so I pray for all of us that we'd be able to do that. Quit gossiping about people. Learn to forgive those who have hurt us. And to be lights that reflect you in this world. Lord, thank you so much. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for our Redeemer, Jesus, who paid our enormous price that we couldn't pay, Lord. And he set us free to be free to love others. So help us to do that this week. We just thank you for loving us and forgiving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.